Dear colleagues, uh, welcome to EAU TV that we record now in Paris uh, for this uh, uh, giant event that is taking place in the City of Light. Uh, I'm surrounded today by uh, colleagues and a wonderful woman uh, uh, who is coming from Cambridge, uh, Lydia Makarov, am I pronouncing correctly, uh, Tom Pauls from London and Matthew Galski from New York. Thank you for being there. We are going to discuss um, a very important matter in the field of oncourology, which has to do with bladder cancer and specifically locally advanced bladder cancer, because I would say a storm is coming, not an evolution, but a revolution. There is a lot in the pipeline. We have been improving as much as we could the surgical techniques in the past few years, but now there are, I would say, new systemic treatments, new options, and maybe Tom, you could be the good person to set the frame about the situation in radical cystectomy. Take Take it into account that in the guidelines at the moment is neoadjuvant chemo plus surgery, uh, which is a long journey for the patient. So what do we have now in the pipeline uh, in the adjuvant setting? Yeah. So, well, thank you for inviting me firstly, my pleasure. To, uh, to this beautiful city. And, and I'm joined by my fabulous colleagues. <clears throat> I think I, th I agree with you. I think a storm is coming to something that's been quite sclerotic for quite a long period of time. When we look at this, going back 20 or 30 years, platinum-based chemotherapy, um, cystectomy, and then there's always been this background issue about trimodality therapy and radiation. And that's a discussion, I think, for a different day. What I think, uh, and, and Matt presented some fabulous data, I, really impressive data, I thought, today. Um, I presented some data as well, and those two pieces are important. I think the data that Matt presented showed an overall survival trend. It wasn't statistically significant, but it was, I think, clinically meaningful. And Matt will talk about that, suggesting that there are patients who clearly benefit from adjuvant therapy. And then my position on circulating tumor DNA, so that's a blood test performed after the surgery, which can identify patients at risk of relapse. And for those patients who are CTDA negative, their risk of relapse at about 10% is quite low. And so we're in a position now where after the operation, we may be able to select patients for a really active therapy. There's a lot more work to do. We're going to talk about that in a second. So it's personalized medicine applied to locally advanced disease in a curative intent. Uh, hopefully, uh, Matt, uh, we are talking about survival there. Uh, you present interesting data. Can you repeat what you have stated in the plenary session? Yes. So we presented data from the Checkmate 274 study. That study had co-primary endpoints of disease-free survival in the intent-to-treat population and then in patients with tumors with high pd one expression. Uh, that was the primary endpoint reported several years ago. We have updated data for DFS at three-year uh, three median follow-up. Um, and so really getting to respectable follow-up periods given the time when most patients recur after surgery. And then for the first time, we presented overall survival data today. Overall survival is a secondary endpoint from the study. It's an event-driven analysis. So these are interim analyses that have been conducted previously. This is the first time they're reported because really the intent was to wait until the final analysis, but given changes in the field and other data sets coming out, we felt it was important to get the data out. Um, in the intent to treat population, the hazard ratio for overall survival favored nivolumab versus uh, placebo with a hazard ratio in the mid 0.7 range. And in patients with tumors with high PD-1 expression, hazard ratio of 0.52. Um, so interim analysis not yet significant, but really uh, the trend in terms of the effect size is almost identical to every other endpoint in this study. Hmm. One of the uh, subjects that we need to discuss, and uh, probably I'm going to you now, is the quality of life. Because as mentioned earlier on, it's a long journey for the patient go taking the chemotherapy. And I believe that the vast majority of the patients you are talking about had chemotherapy, surgery, and then the adjuvant treatment. About 40%. Yeah, 40%. So, and, and so going back to the patient, when you announce the treatment, when you have, you can be afraid of the side effect of the chemo, the morbidity of the surgery, and then uh, what the, the, the dark side of any new treatment, we need to balance that. Uh, how, how do you deal with this situation when uh, you, uh, from the perspective of the patient? 
Certainly. So after surgery, we want, as you said, to do personalised surgery. So we don't want to do over-treatment. We don't want to do under-treatment. So we need to choose a treatment based on the specific characteristics of the patient that optimise quality of life, optimise overall survival and optimise progression-free survival. And we're seeing that there are new ways of looking at this. Perhaps pdl one uh, which is looking at a specific protein on a tumour, perhaps that's not the best way to... Uh, understand what the prognosis of the patient is. And so we're seeing circulating tumour DNA in the blood might be a promising marker to make sure that we are treating the people that need to be treated with immunotherapy, um, but not over-treating the people who do not need to be treated with immunotherapy and optimising the specific treatment for the specific patient. Okay. Can I add something yes, to, to that? Because there's this notion of, um, of biomarkers in the perioperative setting and I think both from a patient perspective in terms of how we explain this to patients, but also how we frame these biomarkers in terms of making progress in the future, the, the, um, the nomenclature that I like to use is biomarkers that identify who needs treatment and biomarkers that identify who benefits from treatment, because these are not actually the same thing. You can't benefit from treatment if you don't need treatment. So say ctDNA negativity indicates that there's no micrometastatic disease. Well, you could give that patient all the treatment in the world, they're not gonna benefit. ctDNA positivity, on the other hand, doesn't mean you're gonna benefit from the treatment that you're gonna give that patient. Their, their individual tumor might not be responsive to mean checkpoint blockade. So I think we actually need both. In the data that Tom presented in Invigor 10, it, it slips under the radar a little bit, but if you look at patients who are ctDNA, who had ctDNA detectable assays after surgery and were pd one quote unquote positive, those were the patients who actually benefited the most or TMB high. So you can layer on these biomarkers who needs treatment plus who benefits from treatment to maybe even get closer to personalized medicine. And trying to be pragmatic, you said that uh, the ctDNA assessment was just a blood test. Um, is it, I would say, back in time when we were doing microsatellite stability uh, assessment, it was just immunohistochemistry and yes. we asked the pathologist was cheap, very uh, efficient and very rapid. What about ctDNA? Is it long? to get the results? Yeah. Is it costly? Does it need specific organization? So to summarize what's happened to date, um, there are two ctDNA approaches one is an informed approach where you take the original tissue, you perform whole lifetime sequencing, you identify up to 16 mutations, and then you track those with time. And that's the approach that we're pursuing at the moment in this environment in Invigor 10 and Invigor 11. In Invigor 10, what we showed was that in, that was the original adjuvant study, it was a negative trial, big study, and we performed CTDA analysis on those patients by doing that blood test, very quick to do the blood test, but it takes time to mm. do the whole exome sequencing so you get the results back a few weeks later. 40% of patients were ctDNA positive, and of those 40% that were positive in that trial, 95% relapsed. The other 60% of patients that were ctDNA negative, their relapse rate was about 20%. That was based off one single blood test. In Invigor 11, what we presented today was the follow-up trial from that. The Vigor 10 was hypothesis generating. It was, a, it was planned, but it wasn't the primary endpoint of the study. In Vigor 11, we're exploring that important issue that Matt described in the positive patients receiving a tezolizumab or placebo to see if a tezolizumab is better than placebo in that environment. But the data we presented today looked at that negative population, the 60% of patients who remain negative, and it looks like those patients aren't really at risk. And so what we now can do is really focus on those positive patients and explore some of the things that Matt talked about, not just with a tezolizumab, but Matt's doing a different study, a study called Modern, where actually he's looking at nivolumab and LAG3 in combination in that high-risk population. I look at this now as in the years gone by, we had symptomatic metastatic disease. Recently, we've had asymptomatic metastatic disease with CT scans, radiologically positive. We now have radiologically negative CT positive asymptomatic disease. And that's probably the best place to cure patients. Okay. One important thing maybe, uh, Lydia has a role in a patient association is to advocate, of course, the disease to the general population, but also to advocate the necessity uh, to, uh, for the patient to accept to be enrolled in clinical trials. It's very important for us because 
we have noticed as urologists that it was not our culture compared to medical oncologists, but also some patients were shy or reluctant or uh, afraid uh, to be committed in a trial. Do you try to have, uh, I would say, arguments, bullet points to defend this strategy? Uh, yes, yeah, so a recent World Bladder Cancer Patient Coalition survey, um, over over a thousand patients worldwide, uh, said that 90% 90, 90 of people reported that they weren't even asked whether or not they wanted to take part in a clinical trial. So uh, I think that we are now seeing urologists uh, having more enthusiasm for multidisciplinary clinical trials. And I would also encourage all of the urologists to make sure that their local patient organization is involved in co-creating that clinical trial as well, because then you're going to get a lot more enrollment and a lot more accessibility of the study because you are designing it um, for the patient population that you want to enroll. Okay, perfect. And as, as clinicians, we are... Uh perfectly aware of the situation of bladder cancer, but there is also the world urinary cavity, urethra, mm -hmm. ureter, renal mm -hmm. pelvis, there is multifocality. And from the checkmate, I, I think that we have also data in upper tract tumor, if I'm correct, and I'm concerned about the forest plot there. Uh, it's not really convincing. Uh, still, the, if the drug is approved, it's approved for all indication. But do you feel that uh, the data were not really convincing because most of the patients who were uh, diagnosed with an upper tract tumor didn't have the uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy? And do you think that the equation of success is new adjuvant, surgery, and then nivolumab, or it's the behavior which is different? Yeah, I think that's, that's trying to read uh, too much into um, subset analyses. I think we have that all of these are hypothesis generating, of course, and I think we have the potential to steer patients in the wrong way by not interpreting the results of the trial as as it was designed to, uh, to answer a specific question. I'll give you an example. I don't know if you caught the forest plots today for overall survival, because I showed them very quickly. The effect size for overall survival on upper tract disease was exactly the same as it was for lower tract disease. The outlier was patients with ureteral tumors, who were a very small subset, who were all the way on the other side of the, uh, of the forest plot. But patients with renal pelvis tumors were, uh, you know, showed a similar effect size. So it just shows you how much noise there is in those subset analyses. But there is a debate in upper tract disease around chemotherapy. There was the POUT study that was yeah. positive. Mm -hmm. And so I think upper tract is an area of real debate. Uh, yeah. And I accept what- Any, you know. any discrepancy in CTDNA uh, expression, renal pelvis, ureter, and bladder? Discrepancy between I, what we know in bladder cancer? I think there's a lot of work to do there. Yeah. Um, we don't know an um, uh, enormous amount about the differences between them, but we know from Vigor 010 that also included upper tract patients that actually they also had a high proportion of CTA positive patients. The question from my perspective, and I think some of the data with FGFR inhibition in upper tract mm -hmm. disease and immune therapy, it's just slightly different. And I think we need to start thinking about upper tract disease in maybe a slightly different way. Thank you. This will conclude uh, our discussion today. And uh, I hope uh, you had a, a good information and take home message to, uh, to, di to digest at home. And uh, thank you and see you soon on EAU TV.